Dear colleagues, good afternoon. We start our panel discussion of the Gaida Forum that is called Divide the Lime of the Global Economy. Today, during panel discussion, it was stated that the fragmentation is the risk for the global economy and the question specified in the agenda uneven distribution of the goods in the civilization and the protectionism and trade barriers and sanctions. Let's try to discuss what should be the true agenda, considering that we had discussion during the first panel discussion. Today we have very representative panel members. Allow me to introduce Herman Van Rampeur from the European Union, Prime Minister of Belgium in 2003-2009, Mrs. Ann Kruger, Chief Economist of the World Bank in 1982-86, and then Deputy Director of the Global uh, Monetary Fund since from 2001 till 2006. Kirill Dmitriev, General Director of the Fund of Direct Investment. Esko Aha, Prime Minister of Finland since 1991 till 1995. Today we have quite interactive panels. Before we give the floor to all the participants, we will be asking members of the audience. And before giving floor to the first speaker, I'd like to ask to show the voting snapshot onto the screen. Do you have remote controls in your hands? Colleagues, please turn on the first question. I will read out what we believe since 2007 till 2017 during the 10 years periods and the variance of responses. Please show me. Please show me the variance of the response. Let me read what I have in the cheat sheet. The, first, the global economy became more global and open. Second, there was a pause with the new wave of globalization ahead. And the third variant, protectionism is growing and the countries protect their own interests. Please show me on the, the answers on the screen. Answers. Time is up. Oh, we have answers. For voting, you have to press any button on your remote control. And when you hear ticking, you have to press the response button. Please vote. Press the optional buttons on your remote control. It takes time. Fifteen percent believes that the global economy is more global. Twenty-eight percent believe that there is a pause, and more than half believe that the protectionism is on the rise, and every country defends its own interest. Welcome to the new globalization. Mr. Rampe, I'd like to ask you the first question. How do you assess the state of the global economy considering your experience, considering what is happening in the European Union, the southern countries, Brexit, is still European Union the space of the universal values? Is there a consensus in Europe? Mr. Rampe, please. Thank you for this uh, very general uh, question, and I apologize if uh, I'm, I will be longer than, uh, than expected. Uh, first of all, uh, looking at uh, the answers, uh, protection is not on the agenda of the European Union. Actually, although there is a lot of controversy about free trade, free and fair trade, 
we are uh, concluding we are, or negotiating free trade agreements with a lot of countries. We just finalized an agreement with, uh, with Japan. We are negotiating with Brazil and Argentina, uh, with the so-called Mercosur countries. Uh, we are negotiating with uh, Indonesia. We hope to finalize soon with uh, Mexico that will be uh, a updated, uh, renewed uh, free trade agreement. We have a free trade agreement in place with South Korea. Uh, we are ready uh, to, uh, to ratify the agreement with Vietnam. So we have go on in the midst of this, apparently, the, amidst the doubts on globalization with free trade as we have the biggest single market in the world, in the European, uh, in the European Union. So it, it, it needs leadership, and I said it also this morning, it needs political courage to go on with free and fair trade. Of course, we have in the European Union, we had our problems and we still have problems. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, Mr. Moderator, Brexit. It's a major setback. It's the first time that a country is really considering to leave uh, the European Union. We thought that the European Union was an irreversible project, that once you are in, you never leave the Union. This is no longer true. And the European Union was considered as a peace project, creating irreversible bonds between the countries so that war was just impossible. Uh, and we have a history, of course, of, of wars, even in the uh, not so far away in time, only 60, 70 years ago, we had the Second World War. So we, for us, it is a major setback. Uh, but in general, uh, of really more specific, I will say this, more specific, Britain was always a special member. We have three pillars in the European Union. We have the common market, we have the common currency, the euro, and we have this common space of visa-free free travel, passport-free travel, what we call the Schengen area. These are the three pillars. Britain was only part of one of the three. So they were the least integrated country in the, in the European Union, uh, and even that was too much for some, or for the majority, uh, in 2016, and so they decided to, to leave. So it is, there's a lot of specific in their membership and in their exit. They thought, our British friends thought, that this was the beginning of the end of the European Union. That would be the process of dislocation. Other exits would follow. This is not the case at all. Nobody is considering to leave the European Union. And nobody is even considering it. On the contrary, on the, in the negotiations between the UK and the European Union, the 27 uh, are represented by the European Commission and speaking with one voice. So not only nobody is leaving the Union, the Union is more united than it was before Brexit. We surprised ourselves even. So this is a very particular uh, situation. Um, if you ask me uh, what the, the future will bring, of course we don't know. Uh, but in any case, for the upcoming years, Britain will in some way or another be, will remain a member of our common market or our, our customs union as a transition to a new phase uh, a new phase, and we will negotiate our future relationship in the upcoming years. But they will remain in the, Europe, in the common market and in the customs union for quite some time. And a lot of people are hoping that once they see what uh, the, the outcome could be of negotiations, it will always be worse in terms of prosperity, uh, in, in terms of influence in the world, will be worse compared to the situation in the transition and the situation in membership. So it is, nothing in life is irreversible. Nothing in life. Some are saying the European Union is not irreversible, but Brexit is not irreversible too. 
So we'll see what the future will bring us. Uh, now for on the short term, with, for the very first time, a second referendum is not a crazy idea anymore. We are not, not at the further stage, but it's not a crazy idea anymore, on the contrary. Uh, and the, the remainers are now in the opinion polls in the lead by a margin of 10 points, which is never seen in the last years. So we, we'll see that this, the future is uncertain. Uh, I think, still think that Britain will leave in 2019, but I'm not for sure uh, they will leave forever. Uh, but then we will focus on our own problems, the problems of the 27, still representing 440 million people on the European territory. Uh, and we will have to strengthen the economic and monetary union, the euro. Some co predicted the collapse of, uh, of the euro in 2012. It was not the case at all. Uh, and uh, we were, of course, challenged in the Schengen area, the visa-free area, which, which Europe is, uh, or the passport-free area, we were challenged by the refugee crisis, where one and a half million people came to Europe in a few weeks or in a few months' time. We survived all this also. We strengthened the Schengen area as we strengthened the economic and monetary union. But what does this mean? Uh, this means that, that we are stronger than expected, but are we ready to face another financial crisis which will happen in the future? We don't know when, but most of us are fear, fear that it can still happen. Will this mean that another refugee or migration crisis will not happen again? We, will, we think that it will happen. We don't know when and how. So we have to strengthen also those pillars of, uh, of, uh, of the Union. And that's the work uh, of the upcoming months after the formation of a German government. Mr. Moderator, on your question, uh, is the European Union uh, is, still, is it still a union of values? You know, in, in life, in the life of persons, in the life of nations, it's always a compromise between your values, your ideas, your ideals, and your interests. It's always a compromise. And it's, the European Union started with, as a union of values, with one major value, peace. You can have a bigger value than that. And the second value was democracy. That's why Central and Eastern European countries joined us after the fall of the Berlin Wall, because they want to anchor democracy. So the, the, these are the key values for, for us. But you have also interests. My region, for instance, my country, we entered the European Union in 1958. We doubled our prosperity in 12 years' time. But we have had the same phenomenon in the East. Poland and Ukraine had the same level of prosperity per capita, per inhabitant, per capita in 1990. Poland is now three to four times more prosperous than Ukraine because they were part of our single market, because they were part of the European Union. This is the interest. So everybody is fully aware that leaving the Union has a cost in terms of prosperity. Leaving the Eurozone is even much more difficult because if you have even the intention to leave the Eurozone, the day after you are pen penalized by the financial markets. Actually, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to leave the Eurozone. But leaving the Union is also bearing a cost. So that is the part of interest. That's why that no country is envisaging, also those who are not agreeing fully with our values, envisaging in leaving the Union. But we have to remain, uh, and there you are absolutely right, a union of values. And we have structures. If there are doubts about the implementation of our key values in some countries, we have structures to face it and to bring them again 
uh, to respect uh, of uh, what we consider as core values for the Union. It's a di always, it is a difficult exercise. And we, for the first time, uh, we are in, in that kind of, uh, of process with one of our member states. But the, the Union is much more resilient than most people thought and most people still uh, think. But we cannot focus only on ourselves. Uh, we are part of the world economy, um, and that's, far, that's why that we are strong defenders of uh, openness. Uh, that's why we are so uh, much opposed to protectionist measures and outright protectionism. And there is an increase in protectionist measures in uh, all over the all over the world. Uh, but there are also uh, positive evolutions. For instance, on climate change, we have this um, major agreement, the Paris Agreement. It shows that multilateralism still can function, still can function. And, and on the key issue for the human race, we could agree. Of course, implementation is, is absolutely key. Uh, and it is unfortunate that one country out of 190 is leaving the Paris Agreements but it will not prevent the others to go on with what the, the, the pledges they made in, in Paris by the end of 2015. So there can be doubts about global governance, but on climate change we showed that under pressure, of course, of the situation in, in a lot of countries, uh, we can overcome differences. Again, implementation of all this is, is absolutely key, and the European Union was able in Paris to speak with one uh, voice, which made their voice, of, of course, much stronger uh, than, 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 than it is only an, an assembly of 27 uh, member states. So um, on global governance, of course, the, the highlights of the high days of, of the G20 after the banking crisis are over. I, I, I attended many meetings of the G20 in 2000, uh, 2011, 12 or 13, it became more and more a ritual meeting. It, it's not an institution. It's not a process. It's too much a meeting. Uh, and of course, uh, when there something, uh, another crisis would happen, I, I, I think there will be some awareness that global governance really is needed. But once that things are going rather well, as between economic growth, as we have three or four percent, uh, as we have now, then they don't feel the need of global governance. Uh, and and that, that's, that, that's, a, that's a pity, of course. With the exception, as I said, on climate change, there was this awareness of, of global governance. So, uh, Mr. Moderator, the um, European Union is doing better than a few years ago. We created 10 million jobs since 2014. Uh, in, uh, in the Union, uh, our, our social cohesion is much stronger than in many other, many other countries. Even the inequality is not rising dramatically in each of our member states and not compared to other major players in the world. But that, make us, that doesn't make us complacent. We know that our structures cannot face another major crisis, be it financial or in terms of migration, we have to make our structures much more solid and much more stronger. But that's the task of, uh, of a new generation of, uh, of leaders and, uh, and of politicians. Each time has its challenges. We overcame our challenges. The others have to overcome uh, new ones. So I, I'm uh, much more hopeful than I was uh, a few years ago, uh, but with arguments, not only because I want to be optimistic and hopeful. Uh, we have arguments, and that makes our statement, in my view, much more credible. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Renke, thank you very much for your optimism and thanks a lot to the European Union for a consistent position. Uh, 
regarding the questions of international trade, climate, and the values that you are continuing to advocate. Uh, before we proceed to the next, uh, to the American uh, economist, uh, Ms. Uh, Krieger, would like to ask uh, another series of questions. Um, uh, please, uh, if you can display them. These questions uh, are about the U.S. policies uh, with respect of the international trade in the nearest six years. So, what do you think the U.S. foreign trade policy will be in the next six years? The options are on the right hand screen. Uh, the U.S. wants is on reducing barriers to international trade for all countries. Uh, the U.S. will set its own barriers and focus on protecting national companies. And number three, the U.S. will aim to change global institutions to review the WTO rule uh, and basic integration agreements in favor of its own interests. So uh, what the United States will do in the next uh, six years, dear colleagues, please uh, take your remote controls and choose one of these three options. First, um, any button, uh, and uh, then uh, your option answering the questions. I think it's uh, been a minute already. Uh, please display the results. 14% uh, reducing the barriers and 42% uh, each for the two uh, options uh, remaining their own barriers and changing the global rules. So we understand the opinion of the audience. Uh, let me ask the next question to you, Ms. Kruger. What's your idea of the current status of the uh, world economy, and especially the U.S. economy? What uh, kind of trends do you see there? Thank you. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, I want to go back first to your first and second questions because I have a sort of a quarrel with the question itself. Uh, you thought that protectionism was defined as a country defending its own self-interest, and I do not think so. I think as uh, Prime Minister Pedro Pui said, uh, the countries that have integrated are doing better, and that opening up is the self-interest path and the one that obviously is best for countries. And that then leads to the question, where is the global economy right now? As you know, uh, for the first time in a long time, at least 10 years, uh, e economic activity is picking up in almost all countries in the world. We have what they call synchronized growth for the first time in quite a while. And so the short-term outlook looks pretty good. I don't think anybody is very worried about it. In the longer term, there are two at least major worries, I think, of. Uh, may probably more, but you can't get everybody pessimistic all at once. Uh, one of which is simply whether indeed uh, the economies will continue opening up and whether we will continue integrating in a way that leads to productive and healthy growth. <clears throat> to that, my answer is probably yes. And the reason is not that every single country will do it. I'm sure some will make mistakes. But because the countries that do do it, maybe it will be the European Union, I hope it will be the United States, Japan, whoever, the countries who do do it will prosper and they will grow more rapidly. And the countries who are protecting and raising barriers and cutting themselves off from the rest of the world will indeed do worse. So the importance of the countries and the regions that are moving in the direction of greater integration will, I think, increase over time uh, almost without question. <clears throat> that has been the case in the world economy at least for several hundred of years. Marco Polo was not the instigator of the beginning of this. It happened before that. And we have had increasing integration over at least the last two or three centuries in a way that the countries that did integrate moved rapidly ahead, and the ones that have fought it and have stayed away from it have not done anywhere nearly as well. So the outlook over the longer term, I think, is obviously some uh, questioners along the way, uh, some not, but the countries that adapt to change will do much better. But that then leads me uh, to my next point, which I think is critical. At least for the industrial countries, but I think for many more, we are to a point where we are rich enough 
So we need to pay more attention to those who are not keeping up, those who feel that they are losing out by change, and we have to find ways to bring them more into uh, the benefits uh, from the economy rather than leaving them behind. There is nothing you can change that won't leave somebody out a little bit. But there are ways of improving the situation. There are ways of sharing the gains. And in the case of what we're discussing right now, namely trade, and at least for the United States, a major problem is that we need to get better adjustment policies so that people who do feel that they're, uh, for whatever reason, and I don't mean just trade, for whatever reason, that they are losing out, they can get additional training, they can get support, they can move ahead which is something where I think all of us are now rich enough that we can do more than we did. I do believe that some of the northern European countries in particular are leading the way in this regard. Uh, the, the, the active labor market policies that, for example, Denmark has undertaken seem to do a much better job of helping people who are forced to move because of, or forced to change because of the dislocation. Uh, they are get good help in all kinds of ways, including when necessary retraining, including help with moving from one place to another. These things have to come in more than they have, I think, in the other industrial countries. Uh, and to talk about trade as the one that is doing it, which is the American discourse, unfortunately, is highly unfortunate because no matter what we do, if we're to have satisfactory economic growth, there will be change. There will be some who will benefit automatically more than majority, but there will be some left out, and if those people aren't helped with their adjustment, I think the countries that don't help them will be in trouble with measures such as we had in the American election uh, that indicate that there are people who are discontent with the current situation and are not getting enough help in the adjustment process. They may blame it on trade, I don't think it is all trade, but that's neither here nor there. The point is that we can do better uh, to help everybody, not just a few, in terms of uh, the adjustments that need to be made. So I would argue that indeed over the longer run the outlook is good, but the outlook means that we do need to adapt to change, we need to welcome it, we need to say it is not all positive, it is positive on net, and we need to take some of those gains and find ways to bring more people into uh, the gainers and to bring, make the, the size of the pie even larger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for your confidence that we will continue to uh, go ahead uh, along this more active integration, more active trade, and uh, also there's a need uh, to face more risks as more and more groups of the population are involved uh, uh, as a result of globalization. So let's go over to our next uh, speaker. Kirill Dmitriev. So we'll try to interact with the audience first, uh, because when we discussed the structure of this uh, panel discussion, which is called demarcation lines in the world economy and, uh, uh, and the sanctions in the world economy, so, but we agreed that we will not use the word sanctions in the title to this panel session. Uh, so we decided to ask the audience whether we should expect another wave of sanctions. So please display the next question. The question is very simple. Should Russia expect a new wave of sanctions in February, March 2018? And the uh, optional answer is no, this is unlikely. Number two, yes, there will be pinpoint sanctions, and number three, yes, serious restrictions will be imposed. Please, uh, if you can take your remote controls and vote. Thank you. 
9.5% uh, believe there will be no UEFA sanctions, 63% that the sanctions will, there will be pinpoint sanctions, and number three, think that there will be more severe sanctions imposed. Uh, so taking into account these answers, my question is to Kirill Dmitriev. Uh, the CEO of the Russian uh, Direct Investment uh, Fund. So how we can work in these conditions? What are the sources? What are the forms of uh, raising uh, foreign investment? How we can develop our investment relations with other countries? Please, Kirill. Thank you very much. I think we are truly discuss uh, quite important issues here, the freedom of trade and investments, the questions that uh, uh, really uh, uh, very important for the uh, well-being of many countries, many nations, and economic growth. So we see two camps here, so to say, two groups. One uh, group of people say that there is a need for uh, freedom of investment, freedom of trade, sanctions are very bad, and we believe that they are right. So these group of people are quite right, uh, right and many of uh, previous speakers belong in this camp. Uh, in this category, but there are others who say that we have to protect the internal uh, markets, uh, uh, so we need to uh, um, ensure there are barriers uh, and using sanctions. So, so when we see that businesses are clearly against sanctions in many countries, so the policies of using sanctions so as to get some uh, political um, advantages uh, on the markets uh, is a negative uh, trend which is very harmful. So as we uh, think about the opinions of the first category of people, we uh, see that as we work jointly with the Middle Eastern uh, countries, with Asian countries, investing in a great uh, in a number of projects in Russia and uh, overseas, so these kind of investments open up really good opportunities. So these are not only economic opportunities, but they allow us to invest in airports, uh, in toll roads and motorways and other very interesting projects in um, uh, Russia. And also, they paved the way towards uh, broader cooperation. Uh, in particular, we know about Chinese policy uh, called One Belt, One Road, One Route. So there's a chance to look into infrastructural projects together with China. We invest in the first uh, uh, such bridge between Russia and China. So as we believe that China uh, uh, demonstrates uh, its um, leadership uh, uh, doing such projects and it's open to cooperation with many countries, so which undoubtedly leads to uh, more intensive cooperation with China and to the fact that many countries want to cooperate with uh, China. We also see quite a big interest in the Middle Eastern countries, uh, increasing trade and investments. Denis Valentinovich uh, Manturov uh, is also uh, heads the State Council, uh, the Interstate Council with uh, uh, Russia and the United Arab Emirates, which has done a lot so as to increase the amount of investment uh, between the two countries. We saw that the visit of the Saudi Arabia King and the joint investment have opened up a really uh, broad um, opportunities for us, and uh, thanks to uh, an active work with Saudi Arabia, we managed to stabilize oil prices, which are close to 70 per barrel right now. But uh, without uh, such agreements, they would be more likely close to 35 to 40 dollars per barrel, which would create uh, the situation of instability on the markets. So that's why going back to this very simple idea, which uh, implies that joint investment and joint trade is uh, undoubtedly something that uh, not only creates new uh, jobs, uh, uh, companies, uh, businesses, and uh, pushes uh, uh, economy, but which also creates bridges uh, between the countries, uh, allowing us uh, to live uh, uh, peacefully and uh, with, as we focus on more positive uh, things on the benefits of such uh, cooperation. So I have no doubts that this approach will be really su successful and a number of strong, uh, stronger countries demo have demonstrated this approach. So, uh, so I believe that uh, talking about sanctions, uh, this is a very uh, myopic policies, I would say. Uh, so, and uh, the sanctions policy is really negative. Kirill, if I can ask you one uh, clarifying question. What uh, 
uh, uh, do, do you change the forms of investment uh, cooperation with many countries? Well, it's true we've been one of the trailblazers that the sovereign fund have uh, started to invest uh, jointly because they used to invest on their own or they uh, provided money uh, to other uh, funds, uh, for example, the Pulka Airport, uh, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, uh, Chinese funds have joined uh, this investment fund together with us and Qatar. Uh, therefore, we see uh, the um, uh, role of investment uh, is growing as we work in the sovereign uh, funds uh, and uh, there's a joint expert uh, study that we've done and the CIC fund, for example, joint fund with China, um, they helped us a lot uh, uh, when we needed to work on certain projects and so they uh, we help them to understand better the Russian market. So uh, we believe that cooperation between sovereign funds is quite an important story. And also the uh, portfolio of companies, portfolio investments, uh, also demonstrated very good results on the Russian market. Uh, no doubt that investments are not just words, but uh, specific results. We demonstrate positive uh, revenues, uh, positive balance in both in rubles and in dollars to our partners, which is a good discipline to all of us uh, that allows us to make good decisions. It's a kind of a credit of trust that allows us to make multi-billion investments in many different sectors of the economy. So perhaps it, uh, it is even easier for us uh, uh, than for politicians, but we uh, use certain parameters of uh, the profit rate parameters, and we do uh, believe that we do hope that the politicians in Western countries will listen to their businesses more, and we hear many voices from Germany, and uh, we hear that Europe wants to have positive relations with, Ru with Russia, and they see a lot of opportunities for increasing capital in their countries. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Kirill. So before we proceed to uh, Denis uh, Mantorov, let's uh, ask the next question, which is already displayed on the screen. Restrictive measures against uh, Russia are first option, uh, politically motivated reasons, number two, uh, the uh, imposed in these specific companies in the specific countries, and the third one aimed at inhibiting the development of Russia's economy and industry. We understand they are supplementary, but let's choose one of those options, political, in the interest of the companies aimed at uh, restricting uh, re containment of the Russian economy and industry. Please uh, take your votes. Results. More than half believe that they are political, the sanctions are caused by political motivation, 15 is about the companies, and 28% is to hinder development of Russia. So, Denis Valentinovich, how does Russian industry feel? Are sanctions hindering factors for the development of Russian economy? First of all, Pavel, it seems that colleagues think badly about our Western partners. I think that things are more pragmatic. And the second answer was political in the interest. No, in the interest of concrete companies, it's rather third. In order to have full-blown competitor, which we became for the last several years, and the second answer is, in certain way, is still support of the companies that are today in the Western countries. So I think that it's talking less about politics and more about economics. As for the sanctions, which 
were introduced against again about our economics, about our enterprises. To certain to a certain extent, the impacted decrease of the external trading and goods turnover between Russia and the West for during for a certain period of time, but it provided a push and challenge for our enterprises that actively started to develop new projects by launching in a way new products, new nomenclature, new product line for the last three years we see results of realization of the program of the import substitution. We didn't set a goal for ourselves to provide needs of internal market. First of all, we set the goal to come to the other markets. So practically we see results of the growth of exports, non-raw material, no energy for the last year. This is the result of systemic work of the government on one side. On one hand, the support of export using absolutely the same instruments used by our foreign colleagues and the result of work in the area of import substitution. Growth of the last year, once again, no energy, no raw material export was about 19%. This is a record indicator for the last 10 years. And uh, we hope to keep moderate growth in export for the next years, considering that we'll have new product line, new goods. So answering your direct question, how do sanctions influence in terms of the technological and industrial growth, it's rather positive rather than negative. As for the comfort or discomfort, I don't think that anybody feel comfortable if you have certain limitations while you realize your projects and uh, interaction with the foreign partners. But as I said, as the whole, for the economy it's a certain plus, but it's not going to be e eternal. Thank you, Denise. I'll ask about integration processes at the post-Soviet space, considering the interaction with the Vietnam Republic, we expect negotiations with Iran, the negotiations with India and China. How do you assess the competitiveness of industry considering free trade with those countries? What's the outlook? As to, first of all, internal processes, Mr. Romper told us about how the integration of European Union goes, and it's on the rise. The same can be stated regarding our Eurasian Economic Union that is based, just like our colleagues one, at the unified custom space based on the free movement without visas between our countries, members of the Euro Eurasian Economic Union. And we have increased good turnover in spite of the U Eurasian Union for the last year by 25% in the same manner. Quite well is growing the turnover between the Eurasian Economic Union and the, the remote countries. Now if we talk about post-Soviet space with the countries of the Commonwealth, it's only 5%. And six percent is uh, the trading with the European Union and uh, with the countries of Asian and Asia-Pacific space. At the same time, if we talk about 
and as it was mentioned, the work on the free trade zones, we carry out not only the union and the separate countries, we don't do it with China, we're not ready to this format yet for now. For a certain time, it, we're not ready to open our market, of Eurasian economic market, regarding certain items. As for Iran, India, Singapore, Serbia, Egypt, we truly do this work, and uh, I think that in the near time, just like with Vietnam, we'll come to the signing with those countries' agreement on the free trading zones. At the same time, this work is done by us deliberately so that we can open doors for our foreign partners. We should not forget, first of all, that um, our industrial enterprises must be to a certain degree comfortable uh, and protected from o opening and the access of the goods from those countries. We found solution with Vietnam, and uh, solutions will be found with stated above countries. And we talk about Vietnam. There was a funny picture when we participated in the negotiations with the Vietnamese partners. In particular, my colleague, Minister of Industry of Vietnam, asked the question, why do you trying to get French Renos? You're not minister from France, you're minister from Russia. I said, maybe it sounds and looks strange, but I'm fighting for the product that is localized at the rate of 80% at the Moscow enterprise. Framos, we realized production of Reno Dasta and Reno Capture. So to a certain extent, this truly caused certain questions. And this is also answer to your question because we're opened. We're opened so much in order to promote French products that is localized in our Russian territory. And for us, there is no difference between enemies and friends. All countries we consider, first of all, very pragmatically as economic partners. So if the foreign partners, foreign countries are ready to place in Russia production facilities, we are ready to provide support measures as much as we do for the Russian authentic producers. So we consider those as Russian authentic producers of products. That's why we're open to dialogue, to partnership, to interaction, so that we can increase, increase our investment component and increase the volume of supplying of the competitive, highly technological products to the external markets. Denis Valentinovich, thank you. Let's give a hand. We'll go further before we discuss interaction between Russia and European Union. Considering previous example, I'd like to ask the audience to answer the final question. It's very simple. Mutual uh, reciprocal sanctions between Russia and EU, the first variant of the answer, the cancelled in the 18th year, they'll be cancelled between 19th and 24th year, the third will last a long time. Members of the audience, please take remotes in your hands and give the answer.
Nobody believes almost they'll be cancelled in the 18th year, but majority believe that it will happen in the coming six years. More than... Uh, so the question to ask AHO, relationship between European Union and Russia, what should the government do, what should be done to return to the level of interaction that we had in the past? and develop a favorable situation. Um, Mr. Chairman, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me again to participate in this forum. I don't even remember when I was here for the first time, but it must have been sometimes 2005 or 2006 when Jägro Geider was uh, among us uh, participating in this forum as, as well. And uh, it has been always as exciting to listen to discussions because you can see that every year discussion has a bit different type of profile and content and uh, you can learn a lot when, when being here. So thank you so much for inviting me again. Before I'm going to comment this uh, uh, result of the, of the uh, questions, uh, I looked at uh, trade figures between Russia and its uh, uh, surrounding countries, let's say so. Uh, yesterday. What is your feeling? I will ask now the audience. Uh, is the trade with uh, China growing? Russian trade with China is growing. How many think that it is growing? Not too many. Do you think that the trade with uh, the European Union is in decline? How many of you is uh, having the opinion that it is in decline? Very few. How many of you believe that it is growing more than 10% or it was growing more than 10% last year? The real growth figure. Yeah, the real growth figure last year was more than 20. So that the European Union exports to Russia increased by 20.2% and the Russian exports to the European Union increased by 23.4%. And what is interesting, uh, Russian, Russian exports to China increased a bit more than to the European Union. Uh, the European Union figure was 23.4 and the Chinese figure 27.7%. But substantial growth in both cases. But Chinese exports to Russia had lower growth rate last year than EU, growth, EU uh, exports to Russia. All this in spite of these sanctions. My first comment is we are putting too much uh, emphasis on these sanctions because they always since 2012 sanctions have not been the primary problem. The primary problem in our trade has been the fact that, that oil prices went down and Russian economy suffered from that uh, substantially, and, uh, and uh, devaluation of uh, your currency uh, has had negative impact on, on, on trade. And immediately, when things started to improve, immediately trade started to grow, in spite of the fact that sanctions are there, and as uh, you expected, that they will stay there. And I agree with you. It's n not realistic to imagine that that uh, the, these sanctions will disappear soon. But the whole idea is that we, in spite of that fact, we still can collaborate. Sanctions and counter-sanctions doesn't mean that we have to stop working together, but we have some restrictions in our collaboration. That is the first comment I would like to, to make. Secondly, if you look at the world economy, um, there was a short period of time, I don't know how many years, somebody in this panel is able, able to give exact figure, but uh, since the Second World War, global trade was growing faster than global GDP until 2010 or 11, something like that. After the financial crisis, we have seen a change, so that global trade growth rate was lower than global GDP growth. 
But last year, 2017, again we have seen a change. Global trade growth rate was exactly the same as global GDP growth. What is the conclusion of this? Trade is win-win game. If trade is increasing, it means that everyone is going to win. And I have to say that I'm quite concerned that everywhere in the world, even in the United States, which is benefiting most out of, the, out of free trade, there is a feeling that it's better to, to close our borders and to start protect our jobs by trying to, to uh, oppose imports. I think there are no evidence that this uh, is, is going to work. It is going to create more, more problems. And uh, I, I'm sure that all countries that are starting to, to protect their markets in a way that is, that is against, the free trade, against free trade principles will suffer sooner or later. And that is not my opinion. That is a fact. Which there is strong evidence uh, for, for, for that. If you want to look at figures, uh, Minister Mykkänen in the previous session already explained what has happened with Finland. We are the best case, one of the best cases in the world showing what free trade actually means and how successful uh, uh, factor it is in, uh, in, uh, uh, in the global context. Then, what about the European Union and, and, and Russia, what is, the, what is the future of our relations? For the first, I think it's a, a total misunderstanding to believe in Russia that a weaker European Union is in the interest of Russia. Don't believe in that. That is fundamental misunderstanding. And again, on the EU side, it's a fundamental misunderstanding to believe that weaker Russia is interest, in the interest of uh, the European Union. We have a lot of uh, bilateral interests. We have many reasons to collaborate, and we have a great win-win opportunity. It's not win-lose game, it's win-win game. We need both uh, urgently growth uh, for many reasons, but we have one special reason both uh, in the European Union and in Russia, and that is demographic reason. With these kind of demographic structures, if we are not able to create growth, we will suffer. And both will face roughly the same kind of problem. And that's why, in order to create growth, we need each, each others. How to get uh, better relations? I'm coming from Finland. Uh, I was 21 when there was... Uh, a major international conference. Do you still remember the European Security and Cooperation uh, Conference or Summit was organized in, in Helsinki 1975? It included a lot of principles how to, how to survive in the global uh, Cold War circumstances, but one part of the, of the efforts included so-called uh, uh, CBS confidence-building measures. I think you, and we all have good reasons to read again the final document of that conference and to analyze how to start creating these confidence-building measures. And uh, I think that is a lesson uh, both uh, Russia and, United, uh, and, and uh, the European Union have to take very seriously. Finally, few words about, about uh, global uh, growth and growth perspectives, which has been a big topic. Uh, if uh, Russia and the European Union want to survive in this uh, global context we are going to face, future global context we are going to face, we have to understand that we need a lot of reforms. Russia needs reforms urgently, and the European Union and European countries need reforms. There is a famous story about how to and when to repair roof. Uh, when it's raining, it's easy to say, not now, let's wait for better, better circumstances. When the sun is shining, it's easy to say, it's not necessary, let's 
let's live like this. I think we both have uh, suffered from, from this uh, roof uh, experience. We have not been able to make the reforms when, when needed. And I hope that now, when finally the sun is shining, not fully, but partly, the European Union economy has been growing faster than the US economy since 2014. You have to remember, the European Union economy as a whole has been growing faster than the, the, the economy of the United States since 2014. And the Russian economy is back on growth as well. So sun is shining, not completely, but a bit. Now I, I think it's time to recognize rainy days are over. Now it's, start, it's time to, to repair the roof, to make the reforms necessary. And I think in, in this work also Europe and, uh, and the Russia needs uh, each other. Sanctions, I hope that they, we will get rid of these sanctions as soon as possible, but that's a very complicated political process. But in spite of these sanctions, I think life goes on and we have good reasons to, to, to try to work together in a realistic and reasonable way. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aho. One more clarifying question to you, please. What do you think? Free trade, free movement of capital and people between EU and Russia, is it possible? And what exactly is needed to ensure that? I was uh, first time in Moscow in December 1974. And if you ask me to make predictions what is going to happen in this country, all my predictions have been completely wrong. And I think it's very easy to predict now that Europe and Russia will not never be able to collaborate in a way that there is going to be free trade, free movement of people and free movement of capital. But uh, I'm optimist. I, I think it is going to happen. But it will take time. We have to be realistic, it will take time, but, but uh, I hope that there is going to be, within my lifetime, that kind of uh, Europe, where, uh, where both, uh, all, all factors of, uh, of production will move freely over the border of, uh, between Russia and the European Union. But it will take time, but... Uh, Americans have a, a phrase, the law of unintended consequences. And I think it's very important to remember that that law sometimes creates surprises. Things are changing in a way we cannot, we cannot predict. So I'm optimistic that that will happen, but as I said, better not to set any schedule for that. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, we have exhausted our agenda, but we still have some time to uh, uh, take questions from the audience. Uh, so we are ready to accept your questions. Please introduce yourselves and, uh, and uh, please uh, say who exactly you want to ask uh, among the panelists. Please. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Irina Rachenko, International Integration uh, Club. Uh, my question is to Mr. Mantorov. As you have displayed, 56% uh, uh, thought that the sanctions are politically motivated, and uh, you insisted that it's uh, uh, it's more uh, number two or third option. So, so you are not thinking of the same lines as the audience. Why? You know, economy cannot work without uh, politics. Uh, so if we are talking about, um, if we are saying that uh, imposing sanctions is uh, a purely political process, I disagree with that. I can't agree with that. Whether I'm uh, with the audience or at odds with the audience, uh, that it's up to you. But I would vote in a different uh, way. Um, 
uh, there are people uh, at the head of uh, countries, leading countries and governments who are responsible for integration, for the development of the economies in their countries. And these people will think in the first instance how they can ensure the growth and the development of their economies. As for the political aspect, in my opinion, uh, this is a kind of a parallel story uh, that um, supports uh, certain economic theories, but I think that the economy is still at the head of all these processes. It still takes the lead. Thank you. Please, your question. Good it's, uh, sorry, it's not emotions uh, that I have been expressing here. It's a very subtle mathematical calculation. Sorry? But you have cited some figures that everything is growing, the economy is growing, and EU panelists said that the trade turnover with China is growing. Have you analyzed the assortment, the uh, product lines, uh, the, the oil and gas prices have uh, increased, you said, 17% uh, for non-raw uh, materials? which means that sanctions are not uh, in this uh, area. Well, uh, let me tell you, as, as regards the decisions that are being made, well, of course, we do make mistakes sometimes. But when I say that it, it is the economic uh, calculation that is the backbone of all this, well, sometimes these calculations can be erroneous. Uh, but nobody believed that, uh, nobody anticipated that we are going to implement the, our large-scale plans of import substitution. For example, uh, the uh, supplies uh, were uh, in uh, the development of the Arctic uh, offshore areas, uh, the oil and gas um, uh, producing equipment that have to be uh, supplied was blocked for us, so we had to develop our own equipment there. But nobody believed that we can do this so fast. We just uh, integrated the fundamental science and the companies that have been contributing towards that, the companies that in oil and gas sector that are still work there. But prior to that, nobody even looked in our direction. Uh, oil and gas companies, uh, the companies uh, that produce machinery for oil and gas industry, you know, the, nobody even believed that we could do anything in this area. But then when uh, technological equipment, uh, when sanctions were imposed on the delivery of technological equipment, we had to face this situation as we organized the pool of scientists uh, and workers, and today, uh, uh, our own products already account for 46 percent, I mean the oil and gas companies, the equipment. Well, we can, of course, ar argue about that, uh, w w what is good or what is bad, and uh, you may disagree with me, but the economic computation, economic fears are at the backbone of everything. That's, that's uh, the main pillar. So, uh, while creating a certain political um, background, of course. Andrei Sondabas, a professor of the Russian Economic University, uh, uh, named after Plekhanov. My question is to Mr. Uh, uh, to the Commissioner of the European uh, Union, Herman van Rompuy. So my question is as follows. Uh, so there are expert um, estimates um, so the, uh, regarding the economic uh, harm uh, the economic damage uh, as a result of sanctions, which is roughly roughly accounts for 50 billion on both uh, parties. So my question is, why can, can't we uh, bring the situation to a certain zero level and to uh, hold an international cons conference of experts and politicians so as to arrive at a common uh, decision so as to ensure that there are no political decisions that uh, from which uh, each party suffers. Uh, please, uh, Mr. Von Rompe. Thank you for this question. This allows me also to comment on other interventions on, on sanctions. 
I'm a little bit surprised, uh, this discussion about sanctions. But on the one hand, the impression is given that uh, it, uh, we can, that Russia can overcome them easily, that they're not so harmful as most people think. And on the, hand, on the other hand, we are speaking about it uh, at length, not only in this session, but also in, uh, in other sessions and, and other places here in, in Moscow. Um, so this is just a surprise. Uh, my second remark is, and that's a nuance, uh, sanctions are always political. They are not economically motivated. They have economic consequences. But sanctions are always taken for political reasons. And I go back in the, in the past, and, and uh, I, I, will, I, I will add immediately that uh, no comparison is possible with, uh, with uh, the sanctions imposed by the EU on Russia and the retaliation coming from, the, uh, from Russia. But I go back in the past. We had sanctions on South Africa, of course, as I repeated, totally different reasons and so on. But it was for political reasons. When we impose sanctions on North Korea, it's for political reasons. So we had a, a, a difference about Ukraine. Uh, and the sanctions came uh, after uh, the Ukrainian crisis and economic sanctions were decided, I was at that time President of the European Council of Heads of State of Government, they came after the downing of that Malaysian airplane, the MH17. Rightly or wrongly, that each has its own evaluation of the situation. But the sanctions were uh, taken and uh, after months of hesitation uh, inside the European Union, but the, the trigger was, was that. Um, and the lifting of the sanctions will come what we call the full implementation of the Minsk Protocol of February 2015. This does not prevent us, as it was said, to work together. But we have to be very clear among ourselves. Uh, if we want really to develop further our strategic relationship we had, when I was president of the Council, we had, we were strategic partners. We concluded even a partnership for modernization and so on. If we want really to take up what was, uh, was in the pipeline and what, which were, what we are developing, then we have to find a solution for the sanctions and the Ukrainian issue. They are both linked. And if we can't find this, then the potential of our cooperation will suffer from it. Uh, and we, ca we, we can make progress also in, uh, in, for instance, this is not really the free movement of people, but visa. Our agreement on visa facilitation now gives the opportunity to 3.6 million people to, f to travel much more easily than, uh, than, than in the past. But we can go further to even to a visa-free uh, area, of course, of, of all the criteria are met, and that, that is only possible when we find a political solution for the sanctions uh, issue. I agree that last year uh, that our trade uh, increased by uh, an impressive figure, but we have also to realize that the level of our trade between the EU and Russia is now almost 200 billion euros. It was in 2012. I know that the energy crisis came in between. It was in 2012, 337 billion euros. It is not only due to, to, to sanctions and to all the rest. As I said, energy played uh, a role in all this. But we are not realizing the full potential of our, uh, of our relationship as long uh, as we have this remaining uh, political, uh, political issue. I hope that we have not to wait decades uh, or even years for finding a, a way out, but this is the way out for redeveloping our strategic uh, relationship. Thank you very much, Mr. Rompen. One more question, not about sanctions, please. 
Dear colleagues, please, the microphone. I also want... Let's ask this person here, colleagues, please provide him with a microphone. I have a microphone. May I ask you a question? I've got a microphone anyway. Who is... Don't worry, please. Aram Yevarkan Durov, uh, Swiss Financial Holding, Ancanesta. My question is to Mr. Manturov, uh, but uh, other panelists may also answer this question. Your colleagues, conflicts, uh, crisis in the Middle East uh, will subside uh, sooner or later, and the economies in the countries will want uh, certain influence, uh, cer uh, certain investments. My company, just as many other companies in the world, are very much interested in such investments, in making such investments, and uh, in certain um, uh, renovation, restructuring projects as well. So what do you think, Mr. Manturov, uh, the Russian, Russian businesses, or Russian industry, and also the Russian factor as, um, as is quite high as a mindset in general among Arab countries. Uh, I, I visited Iran and many other countries and I know this quite well. So my question to you, in the longer prospect, um, uh, is there a, a kind of a basis for um, creating the Rush, joint Russian business with uh, these countries, with these states, seriously, on the fundamental um, basis? Or is these just dreams or some kind of utopia? Do you think, is there such a chance? Can you uh, name specific countries? Uh, Northern Iraq, Syria, these countries. Well, specifically talking about Kurdistan, which is already a state. I don't see any problems in uh, developing uh, foreign economic ties and foreign trade relations with the countries that are really willing to see uh, either Russian investments or uh, the supply of Russian products. Uh, uh, it will always, it's always been like that and will be like that in the future. That's how the normal uh, trade practices are built. And uh, as I already mentioned, uh, um, there were no exceptions uh, uh, with regard to our foreign partners. We are looking in purely at the economic uh, backbone. Uh, the economic uh, uh, structure basis for the development of foreign economic activities. So the countries that you've just mentioned, as we streamline, uh, as they, they uh, organize their economies, well, of course, we will certainly promote uh, the interest of our economic operators. But of course, the companies themselves should be ready and uh, interested in uh, such uh, facilitation. So you mentioned uh, Iran. Um, we have uh, been implementing certain projects there and uh, making deliveries of certain products. As I uh, said earlier today, we are looking into uh, signing uh, the agreement on the free trade zone. Um, in this, uh, so that's why precisely at this stage uh, we are also considering the similar moves uh, in other countries so that that's will allow us to develop the entire range of economic relations thank you very much the last question in the second row please my name is alexander danish i'm the manager of the project office of the north caucasus institute the affiliate of the academy of national economy i'd like to ask mr aho Several years passed since adjoining of Russia to the World Trade Organization. You stated certain numbers regarding the international trade. My question is, what was, in your view, economical effect for the economics of the European Union after the Russian Federation joined the trading organization? Thank you. Mr. Aho. I, I think 
quite often when we speak about free trade we have the feeling that it's trade without rules but that's not the fact free trade is a trade based on common rules and I, I think it has been very important that Russia has has joined this global community having the same same rules and uh, and uh, for sure always when you open the open the market for for foreign trade you have to take a risk because you have to rely that you are able to compete and you are able to create such kind of comparative advantages that will give you strength in the in the in the market but uh, as i told you i'm confident that that is absolutely the only way to create win-win world and also more peaceful world because uh, it's easy to recognize that when when trade grows trade is free uh, the the risk of wars and conflict is much lower than it is when when we try try to restrict uh, or or protect uh, ourselves against against others so in that sense i think that this uh, russia's integration into the into the global community and global trade is very important and i think that it's uh, on the very high on the list of priorities in the russian government as well russia is now very carefully looking at how it is located or positioned on the list of uh, most competitive competitive countries or the best places to make business in the world and uh, and you have uh, strategic targets to improve your position there i think it's very well in line with the idea that markets is is open so in my opinion that's the way how the world goes and uh, I fully agree with uh, Mr. Van Rompuy that, that as long as these uh, sanctions are there, uh, they are prohibiting to take maximum out of this opportunity. Thank you very much. Let's give a hand. I think we should finish. Thank you for your voting, colleagues. All members of this session demonstrated optimism, and I see it as an optimism in terms of the global economy development and decrease of the protectionism and development of European economy in relationship between EU and Russia. With optimism, we look at the numbers and we'll meet each other after a year.